Good morning. We remember the words from the Apostle Paul in the letter to the Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Would you join us please in singing hymn number 645, Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above. are yours, O God. Your loving kindness never fails. Your mercies exceed our ability to measure, number, recognize, or remember. Hear us now as we come before you in a time of confession through silence. As our good shepherd always, gather and lead us to your pastures and your corrals of safety. Anoint us with your grace for newness of life, so that day by day we faithfully serve you among all your people in the way and spirit of Jesus Christ. Friends, let us hear and share with gladness the blessed news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let us hear the word of God, a reading from Psalm 84, verses 1 through 10. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed my soul faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it, with pools of fresh water. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer and give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed one. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. 
I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to live in the tents of the wickedness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is hard to know, maybe impossible to know in several instances, the exact time or setting of certain psalms. And Psalm 84 is one of those. Here's a more or less consensus understanding. One, the psalmist is experiencing anticipation of a journey and traveling. Two, the journey or traveling has been difficult or is anticipated as being difficult. It goes through the Valley of Baca, which means the Valley of Tears. Possibly, the journey is indeed a metaphor for life with difficulty and challenges. And three, the destination is associated with God meeting God's people. So, The destination is actually sacred space, whether that is the temple in Jerusalem for ancient Israelites, or it it may be beyond that historical time, any person's idea of a home place or a cemetery or a national historical landmark. It could be a retreat center or campground or a memory-associated place like the First Presbyterian Church Sanctuary at 1100 Carter Creek Parkway on one street and block, or on the east, 1101 East 31st Street in Bryan, Texas. Tears are associated with the journey, the Valley of Baca. The journey is hard. The memories are powerful, For that reason, whether they are positive or negative memories, the power of the memories stirs emotions. Grief is often an aspect of the journey and of the destination location. If nothing of value was lost, there would be no source of grief. Tears, friends, indicate value lost whether they are saline tears uh, oozing from the eyes, or whether they are already evaporated tears which have left a dried residue inside of us. Tears indicate value lost. Tears indicate also value remembered. Tears indicate a realization that significant value experienced in the past has transformational relevance in the new day. The trip to Bountiful premiered on the American stage in 1950, in movie theaters in 1985, and on television in 2014. In each version of Horton Foote's script, an older woman named Carrie Watts lives in metropolitan Houston in 1947 with her son and daughter-in-law. Ms. Watts yearns for a trip to her home village in Bountiful, Texas. Uh, It's a fictional town several miles southwest of Houston on the way to Victoria. But her son and daughter-in-law are extremely busy and preoccupied. Taking Mrs. Watts on a day trip to her place of birth is simply not on their priority list. But one day, she slips away, she buys a bus ticket, and she travels to Bountiful. The old home place is run down and deserted, but being home is exceptionally moving for her. In the 1950 original stage version, The playwright features Ms. Watts humming and sometimes singing the spiritual, There's Not a Friend Like the Lowly Jesus. Consider that stage presentation where a character like Ms. Watts on her life's journey, which 
in Houston is far more enclosed than she desires. And feeling a need for that life journey to extend at least one more chapter or one more trip. So in Houston and on down the road, she hums and sings, there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. None else could heal all our soul's diseases. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. And then for the silver screen in 1985, 35 years later, the playwright changes the theme song and writes for Ms. Watts to hum and sing Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home. You who are weary, come home. Isn't it the truth that our journeys are many and varied through a lifetime? A psalmist desires to make a trip back to Jerusalem to the temple of the faith tradition. A post-World War II woman in her advanced years decides to make a trip to her rural old home place. Folks in religious communities desire to get back to their worship centers and sanctuaries. Those sorts of locations, however, would not be special to us even sacred, if they were only locations. At certain locations, though, relationships positively experienced help us realize how God meets us through others at a given address. What's sacred is God whom we associate with the place and the people who have been and still are part of the place. It is God we yearn to meet again through the familiar, although the familiar changes as the journey lengthens. Today is June 14th. It's the date designated as Flag Day in the United States. The U.S. flag is a piece of cloth portraying colors in a particular design. It has been and it continues to be a part of the journey of a nation and her citizens for 230 plus years. Perhaps no one has better described the symbolism of the flag and the journey of struggles that enrich the symbol which is the flag. Perhaps no one has done that better than J.G. Braddock Sr. of Charleston, South Carolina, in his 2010 poem, Our Flag. Our flag's not a cloak of righteousness to dignify our selfish quests. Not just another piece of cloth unworthy of our ardent troth or promise. Our flag is meant to dramatize the heights to which we all can rise in making dreams reality, in lifting up humanity, in reaching out with loving care while breathing freedom's precious air. Journeys with struggles enrich the symbolism of that flag. Our journeys as individuals and communities include many struggles, often over many years. On those journeys, there are tears of sadness, disappointment, frustration, grief. There are tears of new realization and positive change and joy. Since my childhood, I can count being a part of four churches which have undergone sanctuary remodeling, another which built a new sanctuary due to growth, and another which rebuilt a sanctuary after its predecessor structure burned to the ground. And, and now, one from which faith community members have been expelled 
due to a public health crisis. In each of these instances, people hoped so very soon to be worshiping again in the sacred place. As a person of faith voiced in Psalm 84, my soul longs for the courts of the Lord. What's sacred is God whom we associate with the place and the people who have been and who still are part of the place. It is God we yearn to meet again through the familiar, although the familiar changes as the journey lengthens. After the Pleasant Springs Presbyterian Church building in rural Rusk County in East Texas burned to the ground on a July night in 1985, their East Texas uh, Associate General Presbyter Ben McAnally uh, met with the church leaders. They met in a living room about uh, 250 yards across the road from the burned and now cleared property where the building was. He got up out of his recliner and went over to the window and pointed out the window and Ben said, Friends, if y'all only remember one thing I tell you, please remember that the church did not burn. The church building over there burned. But the church is right here where you all are, where we are. And God in Christ is right here with us. Not long after that, the Pleasant Springs Presbyterians received an invitation to meet for worship early on Sunday mornings in the building of an African-American congregation approximately five miles away. Now, the Pleasant Springs folks had already decided to meet in the living rooms of two or three different members' homes, so they declined that invitation. When the new building was being built 18 months later, though, the session sent an invitation to the elders from that African-American congregation for them to join. And at the dedication service, as the pianist was playing the prelude, uh, the doors uh, at the back of the pews opened and in strode the pastor and three elders from that church. When I noticed, I walked toward them and welcomed them and led them to their pew toward the front. And when I returned to my seat, one of the Pleasant Springs elders uh, sitting in the chancel, Boyd Patrick, and Boyd leaned over to me and said, in the 35 years of our other building, I don't think anyone except white-skinned people ever came under the roof. That's changed now at the first special service of the new building. And I said, Boyd, when it's God's house and God's people, we can never tell how God is going to surprise us and change us. And he said as he leaned in, Preacher, ain't it so? Mr. Braddock's poem about the United States flag tells us that the struggles of a nation's peoples for the sacred values of the nation enrich the symbolism of the flag. The writer of Psalm 84 tells us that communities of faith long for the courts of the Lord, largely due to the people God brings together on their several journeys with their pain and with their yearnings. So every day holds the possibility of significant value experienced in the past becoming the planted garden from which God's power of transformation once more will yield grace. As Boyd Patrick said, ain't it so? 
All honor and praise be to God. Let us begin our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession this morning with each of us praying in silence for others and for ourselves. How we thank you, Eternal One, that you have given bountifully of your love and yearned for the well-being of each one of your children, for your communing with us, for guiding our consciences, for prompting our partnerships with others as expressions of mutual support. Lord, we are grateful. Join us and join those for whom we pray and lift up in our several petitions, those who are distressed and anguished, those who are ill, worried, experiencing hunger and a shortage of basic necessities, who are mourning from loss, who are facing deep uncertainty. Gather up these, our prayers, and create among all your people wholeness, which is evidence of your care, of your undergirding, and of your strength amid vulnerability. Now again, we pray as Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. into the world today and this week. Let us remember to listen for God's calling on our lives, to love and care for others in humility. And may we do all things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.